we want to now uh, take a little bit of time uh, to consider the Word of God relative to uh, Hanukkah. Uh, as was noted for us, uh, we are moving ahead uh, with Hanukkah. And, uh, and we have glorious opportunities because of the length of the festival to be able to teach on it. And so we consider uh, maybe the most important element of Hanukkah. Now, for those who are merely aware of the traditions regarding Hanukkah, you may think the most important element was that the oil lasted eight days. Well, that was a legend that was brought up hundreds of years after the fact. Uh, and so all of the uh, Facebook posts I saw to tell me that if my phone only had 10% charge and lasted for eight days, I would understand the miracle. Well, I appreciate that would be a miracle, you're right. But in any case, that's just not. The real miracle was what God did in order to dedicate, rededicate his sanctuary. How does that mean dedication? That was the real miracle, what God provided to bring that about. Because a dedicated sanctuary is really the only useful uh, opportunity that we have to glorify God. And so uh, you've been sitting now, it goes on almost a minute and a half. You need a stretch, I'm sure. Uh, so let's stand, we're going to read a couple of scriptures, and then you'll be sitting for a while. Let's read together, there's two of these, so let's not be in a rush. Uh, let's go, here we go. So King Solomon and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God. Lord, we pray that that would be the case, that we would understand the price that has been paid so that we might glorify you. And we would dedicate ourselves. Uh, not that we would become more sanctified accordingly, but that we would appreciate the price that has been paid. And that we rejoice in the goodness of God that provided fully, completely, and forever. That we might be his children, be his servants, and be a temple of the living God. And we pray, bless your name, for we bless it, B'Shem Yeshua, HaMashiach, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated, if you will. And so as we consider for the visitors who are here with us and those live streaming from around the world who may not be aware of what Hanukkah is about, let me give a little bit of an introduction on the basic matters. Uh, the word Hanukkah, as I noted, means dedication. Uh, and it celebrates the rededication of the temple. Some of us may need some rededicating ourselves especially had to do with the rededication of the altar. You could not put holy sacrifices on a defiled altar. And so a rededication of the altar. And it was uh, led by Yehuda Maccabee on uh, Kislev, close to December 25th, 165 B.C. And so uh, it's celebrated for eight days, and even though, as I mentioned, the, the legend of the oil is probably the best-known feature of the holiday, it came around hundreds of years later, uh, we read in 2 Maccabees 10.6, the historical issues, that because they were not able to properly celebrate Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, eight days, an eight-day festival, therefore, when they could, they immediately uh, wanted to reenact that uh, in regards to a cleansed, dedicated temple. And so, uh, Earlier, three years earlier, the problem occurred when a Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, strived to Hellenize the world. Everything was Greek to him, and it all be Greek to you too. That was his purpose. Uh, but the Jewish people uh, were found to be a little bit, oh, how can I put it, stubborn. You know, uh, this is just, we, we consider it a charming quality, by the way. But, uh, it didn't go over well with Antiochus. And so uh, he prohibited uh, following Torah, captured, desecrated the temple, sacrificing a pig to Zeus on the altar, forced 
went around to all the cities, uh, Modin finally came to and found stubborn people who wanted all Jews to sacrifice pigs on an altar. Uh, but uh, Mattathias, uh, the dad of the family, stood up and started the grassroots revolt, the Maccabees, the grassroots revolt, to recapture the temple and rededicate it to holy worship. When you read uh, the historical accounts of the first and second Maccabees, the only thing they cared about was not getting rid of the Syrians. The, the, the only thing they cared about was having a temple to worship God. It wasn't a political issue at all. It was always a spiritual issue for the spiritually minded, as a matter of fact. And so, uh, even though it was prophesied uh, in chap Daniel chapter 7 through 11, uh, Hanukkah as, as a festival is only found, as we've often studied here, in the New Covenant in John 10, 22. Yeshua identified with it, uh, observed it, and actually has a very strong teaching about himself and Hanukkah in that section of Scripture. Uh, why? Because... Hanukkah prefigured his work, his work to cleanse us as God's temple. Therefore, Hanukkah prefigured the work of the Messiah. Uh, and so, for those who are thinking, you know, what would Yeshua do? He would celebrate Hanukkah. Um, when we deal with the idea of Hanukkah, you know, it comes from a, a word, Hanak, which means uh, in the root, to make narrow, to limit usage to limit usage. Very similar to another Hebrew word, chadosh, holy, to be set apart. Both words really have to do with being restricted for God's use only in application. Uh, God's use only. So we talk about our dedication. God dedicated us in Messiah for, God, for his use only. Uh, you say, well, what about some me time? Yeah, well, we try to repent of all that me time. Uh, selfish orientation. It's not fulfilling your life, it just corrupts you. Our lives are fulfilled when we actually serve the living God. This is, you may not understand that because all you know is religion, but a relationship with God's fulfillment for your soul. And so, uh, with the rededication of the temple, we saw the principle that was being laid out for us. Uh, God only blesses and fulfills what is cleansed and dedicated, set apart for him. You can't be dedicated until you're cleansed. That is the real issue on the matter. And if you are cleansed, that will be seen in that you're dedicated. Did you get that? So you say, well, I'm not too much on dedication. I like just do my own thing. That shows where you are uncleansed, where you're defiled accordingly. And so a uh, defiled sanctuary, like defiled people, uh, spiritually undedicated, unusable, unblessed by God and therefore uh, have a spiritually unfulfilled life. Listen carefully. You're not defiled because you're undedicated. You're undedicated because you are defiled. Did you get that? Your dedication does not cleanse you. <laughs> it merely shows that you're cleansed. The areas that are cleansed are what you've dedicated now to God. You say, well, hold a second. That means a whole lot of my life is, un is like nasty. We all were praying for you. We're glad you figured it out. Great, let's all go home now. No, no, no. And so when we consider the matter of what's going on here, Scripture reveals faith uh, in the Messiah. Uh, the people of God are a dedicated sanctuary, even as we read at the outset. And so, uh, what's God up to? He's always been doing the very same thing. Uh, God is kind of the same yesterday, today, and forever. So things don't change. The needle doesn't move a whole lot with him. And so, when we think about it, whether it was uh, in the garden, or, or is my microphone going in and out? No, it's your hearing. I just, no, no, no. So whether it was the Garden of Edom, or whether it was the tabernacle in the wilderness, or whether it was the temple in Jerusalem, or whether it was Messiah of Israel, Yeshua, whatever it may be, it always had the same purposes, the same principle, and the same application. God's desire for, uh, for humanity, uh, Jew and Gentile alike as it turns out, 
uh, is to dwell amongst his people, even as we had in our call to worship. The portions were specifically chosen relative uh, to our time of worship today. And so this was always God's case. God created people to be in fellowship with himself. God created you to have a relationship with himself. That's why you were created in God's image according to his likeness. So you could relate to him and thereby represent him. But when sin entered the human equation, we broke relationship and therefore misrepresent him and not enjoy the very purpose of our existence, which is only found in relationship with God. This is the wonderful thing that has been done for us uh, in the Lord. And so sins, our sins, our selfishness, our own peculiarities, perhaps, whatever you want to call them, uh, they, uh, that we have to be forgiven by God's gracious blood atonement. There wasn't no forgiveness without blood atonement. I, what if I'm really, really sorry? Well, I'm glad you're really sorry, but that doesn't do it either. You know, like the chaplain in prison who saw a prisoner crying and weeping, the chaplain went over to the prison and said, I can see you're really, really sorry about what you did. Do I need another microphone? Okay, can you, can, are you keeping up with me okay on this stuff? I'm sure the people downloading this will hear beep, boop, beep, boop, boop. Anyway. But the point is, the chaplain went over and said to that prisoner who was crying, I see you're really sorry about what you did. He said, yes, next time I'm wearing gloves. Most people are sorry about being caught. They're sorry about their guilt. Or they're sorry about the consequences of their actions. God sees that and the vanity of it. No, no, no. Even if you're not sorry, your sins still require blood sacrifice for forgiveness. And so when we consider that matter, we want to understand that this would actually bring us to a place of being a rededicated temple for holy service, uh, since a holy God can only dwell in the midst of a cleansed and holy people. There's just no other way the Bible reads. You're not going to find anywhere in the Bible that's different than this statement. And so, uh, the great dedication of the first temple under Solomon gives us a real pattern, a beautiful divine picture of uh, personal dedication as we are individually and corporately his temple. Uh, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit if you're a child of God? If you've been bought with a price, Messiah's death and sacrifice for your sins now restores you to the purpose of your creation and calling. And so, as we consider that, we'll look at three things. You say, well, what were we just looking at? All that was just introduction. Dedication is costly. As we look at the section of Scripture, dedication is consecration, uh, and dedication, dedication is comprehensive. It takes in everything. As we consider the matter to begin with, let's take a look at the Scriptures here. Uh, since you all are so literate, Let's read together the portion of scripture I have up there right now, 1 Kings 8.63. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 1,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the sons of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord because there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat of the peace offerings. For the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to hold the burnt offering and the grain offering, the fat of the peace offering. This is the background which we understand uh, the price of dedication uh, for our souls as well. Let's understand and make some application. Uh, Solomon offered 142,000 animals. Where is Peter when you need them? I mean, this is outrageous, don't you think? I mean, 104, I mean, that's like herds, you know, like, got to be like from a Texas or something like that. 142,000 animals. Why? Because dedication is actually measured in the sacrifice that is made. When we understand these issues, we can appreciate how dedicated God is to our salvation in the price he paid. And we can also understand how our life will be growing into that very same truth. And so why did Solomon offer so much? 
Uh, it's not merely because he was a great king and he could do it. Too much is given, much required, certainly. Great wealth is not enough, even though there are some billionaires that are boasting about paying their way into heaven by the, by the great contributions, financial contributions they are making. <laughs> that doesn't work that way. Solomon certainly understood that. It's not because of his love for God. He didn't try to do as little as he could, but as much as he could. But his sincere love is not enough. Some of us can be quite deceived by the sincerity of our love for God. We forget that the scripture warns us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked beyond all understanding. <laughs> so you actually are deceiving yourself by judging yourself as worthwhile because of your sincerity in your love for God. Be careful of that. It was because he knew all of this, the great contribution, the great offering, many sacrifices that he made, he understood that it all prefigured the greatest sacrifice of all, Messiah, the Lamb of God. And so he wasn't trying to buy his way in. He understood what God would be providing in the Messiah, the full, ultimate, and final sacrifice. And his sacrifices merely reflect, reflected his faith in such a great sacrifice as well. Because only a perfect offering is enough. And so when we think about what the Bible teaches on, in this regard here, our actual dedication as God's sanctified temple was through uh, the gracious sacrifice of Messiah. In other words, we needed a perfect, not even 142,000 animals. That was not sufficient. It still isn't sufficient. You say, well, I'm doing the best I can. No one's doubting your sincerity. The only problem is if you actually believe your sincerity is sufficient. You're actually deceived because by no works can you save yourself. You need the work of God, what God has done for you. Stop trying to validate yourself in your own mind. And hopefully you're thinking maybe in the mind of God. Validate yourself by some efforts, by some activities, uh, by some sacrifices that you're making. That's all a vanity of the mind. That's foolishness of the flesh. All of these things merely prefigured, looked ahead to the full final sacrifice of the Messiah. Our own dedication actually is a response to the love of Yeshua and our growing gratitude for his great offering. In other words, when we're trusting in the sacrifice of Messiah, that is seen in our responsiveness to it. Your faith in the sacrifice of Messiah is seen in your faithfulness. It's not your faithfulness that should be the object of your attention. It's Messiah's sacrifice, what he did for you, what he did for you. And then your trust in that sacrifice is going to be seen in the life you now live to the glory of God. He gives you what you need as you die to yourself and recognize there's no good thing in my flesh, oh wretched man that I am, as we sang. There's nothing good in my flesh to commend me or validate me. Uh, let alone save me. And so therefore I died to myself by trusting in the death of the Messiah. And in doing so, as I died to myself and trust in the Messiah, now I am enabled by his work to be able to live out his life and love and gratitude to him. It's a thanks offering as such. And so our spiritual maturity is going to be seen in our growing dedication of our time, talent, and treasure in light of our faith in him. It's going to be measured accordingly, uh, not because by doing so we are saved, but it shows that we're growing in the love of God depending on his sacrifice, his sacrifice alone. Uh, uh, there was a, a religious person who was kind of despising Yeshua. Uh, and when he saw Yeshua having his feet washed by the tears of a woman who had been a kind of an unsavory person, he kind of judged Yeshua, saying to himself in Luke chapter 7, if he knew, if he, he knew what kind of woman that was, then yeah, but he can't be a prophet. How could he? he does, look what's going on here. He doesn't understand what of a stinking woman this is. Let you know, him touch her. Crazy. It's just crazy. 
And so he said, Yeshua said to the religious person, uh, he who is forgiven much loves much. If you think you've only had to be forgiven for like a half a buck worth of sin, you probably only love God according to that shows, uh, reflects back about what you actually think you've been forgiven for. But if you understand the sacrifice that has been made, if you understand the desperate situation we are in, that there was nothing that we could do, there was no prayers we could pray, there was no, nothing we could do to save ourselves, but God being rich in mercy, he now provides the final, complete, and perfect sacrifice that by faith in him, now our faith in him shows that we are forgiven much, and so we love much. We appreciate that all the more. It comes as a response to the very work of God, not our own works as a substitute for God's work. And so when we look at the dedication of the various temples and tabernacles, Moses uh, dedicating the tabernacle, uh, Ezra and the Maccabees uh, regarding uh, the matter of the temple here, much less than Solomon had done. But it's not how much we give, but how fully we give as we grow in his fullness. And so whether you're growing in the Messiah is going to be seen in your time, talent, treasure, in more of your thought life, uh, being honoring to him, in your relationships, being more honoring to him, and not because you're trying to make yourself better, because you're depending upon his sacrifice, and therefore not depending on your own flesh, but who he is and what he has done for you. And so this is going to be not so much how you give, but how fully you give, because the widow's might. When we think, well, why were they giving widow? Why was the widow giving a mite, a coin or two? Well, that had to do with her identification with the sacrifice. In other words, her giving was her re response to the sacrifices made for her soul. And so Yeshua said, she's doing better than everyone else. And they all said, what are you kidding? She's giving like you know, 10 cents or something like that. And everyone else is giving much more. They're giving, Yeshua said, out of their abundance. She's giving out of her scarcity. And therefore, she was reflecting more of her heart, more of her heart, depending upon what was done for her in the sacrifices. And so you may not be, uh, you know, a billionaire, but you live a life in light of who you are. And it shows, therefore, the fullness of, of your love, recognize the fullness of salvation for you when you're responding accordingly. That's why every Shabbat morning, uh, we, we give all our heart and soul and might. Or we dedicate ourselves to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul. Not because in our flesh we even can. But we recognize in light of the sacrifice that has been made, we are now empowered to love him with all our heart and soul and might. And perhaps therefore through this teaching, the Holy Spirit's even going to bring to mind those areas of your life. Uh, that you have not been worshiping him, or that you have not dedicated him because you haven't been cleansed in those areas. Maybe because you haven't got caught, or you think it's not a big deal. Don't wait until you're circling the drain. You want right now to take the opportunity. Uh, we worship uh, him who is worthy of all in light of what he has done for us. And so, uh, if you were to measure your dedication by your time, talent, and treasure as reflective of your gratitude for a sacrifice, uh, would you be loving God with all your heart and soul and might? Or, or do we just go through some hypo hypocritical kind of religious uh, actions by saying those things we say? Or is it reflective of the desire of our heart to honor him with all that we have? Or are you just there for just giving him any spare moments, spare energy, or spare change? You know, uh, this is the undedicated, ungodly life, not trusting in the sacrifice. Thinking, well, you know, <laughs> I remember when I was a baby believer, uh, and I was once even less mature than I am a child. It's hard to believe I could be less mature, I understand. Be that as it may, I remember going to a service uh, in New York City, and uh, there was no place to park. I had to pay six dollars to to go listen to the sermon. I remember sitting there with my arms folded and thinking, "This better be a six dollar sermon." <laughs> what an idiot! 
<laughs> oh, thank God for forgiveness. Uh, but that was my immaturity. I didn't understand uh, the value of what had been done for me. I only had to grow into that. I had to appreciate it more and more as I matured. And now all I have is for him. Uh, and I can laugh at that younger version of myself that really wasn't really mature in these matters at all. Uh, so uh, that was just uh, uh, an undedicated life at that point. And so as we come now to the second point, understanding not just the cost, but now the consecration, the setting apart of our lives, the 24-7, 365 aspects of it. The king dedicated the house of the Lord and consecrated the middle of the court. And so when it says there, uh, regarding all the various dedications of temples and tabernacles, Maccabees, Ezra, Moses, Shlomo, uh, all understood the house of worship was for God's use only. In other words, uh, they understood that once it was cleansed, it was now, because it was cleansed, it was now set apart for God's use only. Uh, spiritual usefulness began at that point of dedication. And so you're cleansed in order to now say, Lord, now I can serve you in this area where you've forgiven me and cleansed me. Now I can live for you, I can honor you. Uh, and, but you say, well, I'm cleansed, but I'm going to live for myself. You just defiled yourself all over again. You just jumped back into the pig pits of selfishness. No, 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 don't do that. Don't be a silly person like that. And so uh, when we consider the matter that the dedicated for his service was not just one day a week, it was every single day was set apart unto God. That was the tabernacle and temple. Every day was set apart unto God. Uh, and so it wasn't just one day out of seven. It wasn't like on Tuesdays we could be dealing drugs out of the tabernacle or temple or having, you know, a Las Vegas night, uh, you know, on Thursdays in the temple or something like that. That would, that would be ridiculous. Would be, why? Because you're defiling the temple or tabernacle. You're defiling it. You're defiling it. You say, well, what do you mean? See, Percent dedication, or whatever limited dedication you may have of your life, leaves 90% desecration. You know, we talk about tithing. People who are members here make a commitment uh, to help with the, the, the congregation, all it is. We, we tithe to the Lord here, etc. And they say, well, I'm giving 10%. No, you're giving 100%. It's just that uh, it's all for the Lord. It's not like you give 10% to the work of God in your finances and 90% in some corruption and some evil doing with it, some works of mere selfishness. You're corrupting yourself. You have to be thinking, oh, 10% certainly for the work of God, but then 90% for the work of God everywhere else I have to go. Everything else I have to do. It's all for his glory. Well, lest I corrupt myself with some religious thinking like that. Crazy. And so what defiled areas of your life are not set apart to God and for his glory and honor? Uh, what relationships are things that are, are not going to be honoring to him? What relationships do you get together just to gossip? Or because people are living you know, vain, selfish, corrupting lives? Uh, what, what days of the week do you give over to corruption? Uh, what, what chat rooms are you in that you should repent of? What TV shows are you watching? What, what online activities you're involved in? You know, I, I pray through uh, Facebook uh, because I'm uh, sometimes so embarrassed by how people uh, just kind of are so corrupting themselves and whoever else is reading their posts without prayer because they're, all they're doing is you know, arguing and yelling and, and hating this one and hating that one and hate the Republicans and hate the Democrats and all this is just so much corruption. It's evil doing. Uh, we have to love our enemy. Amen. You have to be very careful of thinking you can have an unrighteous reason, you know, a righteous reason to be unrighteous. It's all vanity and foolishness. You corrupt yourself in thinking that you're on the right side of those matters. You're fooling yourself. So I pray through Facebook for all my friends and loved ones who are there. And the areas that are unblessed and usable uh, to serve God, that those things are not helpful and not edifying and not going to be used for the purposes of God for your life. 
God only blesses those cleansed areas that are dedicated to him. So we want to trust in Yeshua's sacrifice in every area of life every day. This is what we grow into. So today you want to give another five minutes. What during your week can you give five more minutes to honoring God? You say, that doesn't seem like much. Start somewhere. It's quite all right. We all start somewhere. Can you give five minutes of prayer in the morning, of devotion? It's not that your, your prayers are going to sanctify you, but you're going to be loving God, trusting and thanking him for his sacrifice and reflecting back your thanksgiving to him for who he is and what he has done for you. Start there if you can. And so the last thought, dedication is also comprehensive in everything, in every area. Brown's altar was too small. As we read earlier, uh, the, the, they had to do something different. The offerings that Solomon was offering reflecting the great sacrifice of Messiah because he had so much to give. And so in the temple, uh, they had an area before you could get in to the actual temple proper as such, where the menorah was, the illumination, uh, we understood the things of God, uh, where the showbread was, which gave nourishment to your soul, uh, before uh, you could uh, be involved in any of those, uh, where the golden altar of incense for prayers up to heaven, that's what was in the holy place. Before you could get in there, you had to go through the sacrifices. There was no illumination, there was no nourishment in your soul, there was no effective prayers without first having the sacrifice. That was what was essential to coming into the kind of glorious relationship in the holy place there. And so the temple uh, altar was only 30 feet by 30 feet, when you read through the Torah on the matter. And it had to consecrate uh, in the temple courtyard, because the altar, uh, that in the regular altar was just too small. And so when we think about it, here's a picture for you. Everyone likes pictures. I know that. Here you go. And so here's the temple of Solomon and how it was laid out. And so you see where the altar is, I trust, in the upper uh, right corner there, uh, the bronze altar where the sacrifices were usually made. And so what, but he had too many sacrifices for that stinking little altar there. And so that was the altar, but... He had to set the whole middle of the court. The whole area now became an altar to cover the sacrifice uh, that he was making. Uh, how much more our Messiah's sacrifice? And so we consider the matter, uh, the greater uh, than all of those sacrifices, what, what Yeshua has done. His once and for all sacrifice for all of our sins. I mean, you say all of our sins, even the ones you're not aware of. I mean, there's so many things that you, your thoughts, hundreds of thousands of thoughts a day, uh, and all of them are probably, you know, many of them vanity and foolishness or anxiety or fearfulness or strange thoughts. All of them are needing forgiveness and sacrifice, and Yeshua is one sacrifice so great and so glorious, it takes all those sins into uh, consideration. Forgiveness for all those sins is once and for all sacrifice that he made. A dedication uh, of our lives to God, setting us apart, sanctified unto him. Let's read the verse from Hebrews 10.10. Uh, 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah. One set apart, not only saved, but set apart by his death. That's why as you grow, it's by looking to what he did for you. Running the race, looking unto Yeshua, abiding in him. It's all about what he has done. That's how we grow into the fullness of maturity in the Messiah, ourself. His once and for all sacrifice. And all the altars that we come up, generally, of all our time, talent, and treasure, uh, they can maybe handle the little sacrifices that we think we're doing. You know, I'm going to give God a, a Saturday morning, okay. You know, and so you have an altar that's not any bigger than the sacrifice you want to make. And, the little, and so therefore your structure is following your strategy. Uh, having a, a very small strategy, you don't need a big structure. You don't need a big altar because you're not expecting to really make a big sacrifice out of the whole deal here, you know. But now you come to terms with what God has done for you. 
what God has done for you, not the small sacrifices that you may do to validate yourself, to make yourself feel good about yourself with whatever little finances give to the poor or whatever you may do. Now you come to terms with the fact of the once and for all sacrifice of the Messiah. Uh, for eternal life and through his death and all that he provided for us. Uh, all, we need a comprehensive altar of all of my heart, all my soul, all my might, all my heart, all my soul, all my might to understand the magnificence of the very sacrifice of the love gift God has given us, that we give him all that we have. This is the calling of God that Hanukkah reminds us of every year. Why the whole body of Messiah needs to follow Yeshua's example in observing it to understand the dedication that he made for us to be the temple of the living God that his name would be glorified in us, uh, that he would get all the glory because of the sacrifice that he made on our, our behalf. And so God does not empower and does not utilize and will not bless a desecrated temple. But God being rich in mercy, with a love that's beyond our full comprehension, provided for us the once and for all sacrifice. So those undedicated areas that are powerless and unusable and without blessing, we can give them to the Lord. We can bring our relationships, our responsibilities, all that we have, that God, and say, Lord, thank you for cleansing me. And so may all of this be a, a, just a, a thank offering to who you are and what you have done, that you would get all the glory in all these matters, in faith, with gratitude for his perfect sacrifice. Let's dedicate ourselves. 24-7, 365, certainly. But start with five minutes. If you can't do five minutes of thankfulness for what he's done, you may not appreciate yet all that he's done for you. <laughs> all that he's done. We need eternity uh, to give us sufficient time to give him praise and thanks for the glorious provision he has made for us. That his name be glorified in all we have. That Messiah would get the praise, the honor, and the glory for all he's done. Happy Hanukkah. Let's bring our hearts before God in prayer. As our hearts before God, it's our custom. You know, we want to make our life an altar. <laughs> what we had before was just too small. Let's give him all our heart, all our soul, all our might. He is worthy of all because of what he has done for us, forgiven us all our sins. So therefore, we can now, in thanksgiving, give him our time, our talent, our treasure, our thought life, our relationships, to the glory of his name. Bring your heart before God in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cleansing. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for your great love for us in the offering of Messiah, that we would be saved, set apart for your glory forever. And even now, Lord, as individuals, as families, as a community, we just want to ask that we would be privileged to glorify you even more. Show us what areas need your cleansing that we can then dedicate to you. That your name may be glorified in each of those areas of life. And so as our hearts are bowed before God, our eyes are closed in concentration. Give more of your soul to him even now. He, he hears your thoughts. He can see your life inside and out. Bring it to him. Bring it to him. And if this morning you're placing your faith in his atonement for the first time, even now he wants to bless you abundantly with the knowledge of forgiveness, with the assurance of eternal life. So if you're here and you're placing your faith in him even now for the first time, right where you are, pray with me this very simple prayer. Oh, dear God, forgive me 
for all my selfishness, for all my fears, for my pride. Cleanse them away through the atonement, the blood of Yeshua, your son. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Yeshua's name, amen. Father, add your blessing, I pray, that we might leave here as your instruments of good news, that the name Yeshua would be glorified in our thoughts, in our words, in our interactions with one another. For it's in his name we give thanks. Amen and amen. May God get all the glory. Let's give him some praise right now.